Polinko from, from University of Montana. If you missed any previous webinars and would like to watch them, you can find recordings of all webinars on the White Bark Flix YouTube channel, which the link for is now in the chat. We'll start off this webinar by first introducing Jody Krakowski to give an update from the Canada White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation. Jody has served on the board as vice president since 2015 and is an independent consultant involved with Five Needle Pines since the late 1990s. As co chair of the provincial White Bark and Limber Pine recovery team, Jody helps implement the recovery plans throughout Alberta ranges. In her prior role as a provincial gene conservation specialist for Alberta, Jody worked on gene conservation of native forest species and applied forest genetics projects and policy. She spent most of her career gallivanting around the forests of beautiful BC as a consultant, terrestrial ecologist, forester, and research scientist with the University of British Columbia and the BC Forest Service. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jody. Great, thanks so much. So um, yeah, I just wanna thank everyone for making the time to uh, join us with this awesome webinar series. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation of Canada is devoted to the conservation and stewardship of white bark and limber pine ecosystems in Canada. <laughs> um, we're a registered not-for-profit in BC and Alberta. I'm the vice president and uh, many of you guys already know White Bark Randy, who is our president. Uh, I'll just provide a really brief overview of our organization and some of the projects and programs that we're working on these days. For the past few years, we've grown really rapidly because of awesome members and just some great opportunities coming up with Five Needle Pine initiatives. Our board is a really hardworking bunch of volunteers from all around BC and Alberta. Our executive director, Barb Gass, um, is helping us right now hire some additional capacities of program manager. And I'm putting the link in the chat if you know somebody that wants to be our new program manager field work opportunities as well. Um, in 2009, our organization was founded after Canadian members of the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation started um, asking for more Canadian specific content as we have some different ecosystems, different policy and different management issues in, in Canada that affect our five needle pines. Of course, though, we keep connected with the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, as Michael Murray likes to call it, the mothership, <laughs> so that we can both work together to meet our shared goals. Uh, we coordinate national recovery efforts for five needle pine in Canada, and we take to date partners have planted almost 1000 hectares, which is 2500 acres of plus tree seedlings and done a whole bunch of other restoration activities, including mountain pine beetle protection with bourbonone, prescribed burns, thinning, daylighting, and other stuff. Lots of cone collecting and seed processing as well. Parks Canada leads the recovery work in Canada on federal lands. And on provincial lands, the White Park Pine Ecosystem Foundation of Canada supports and delivers recovery planning and implementation with the provinces. Most of the land um, that five needle pines grow on in Canada are on provincial lands. Also, we're involved in cross-border partnerships like the Crown Managers Partnership, especially um, the regional spatial restoration planning process that has been led by the awesome Melissa Jenkins. Um, I think you guys recently heard a talk about that, maybe last year. And we're gonna be expanding this approach to support this science and values-based restoration planning for five needle pine across Canada with our partners. In 2022, we hired the awesome Stephen Joyce after he retired from his long career in the Ministry of Forests and in industry working on tree improvement. And he's our seed orchard coordinator. We co-manage two rust resistant seed orchards for white bark pine and one limber pine orchard in Alberta with our partners, Parks Canada and other partners too. We've also established some clone banks for gene conservation. As you know, there's been a lot of wildfires. So we wanna make sure that important genetic material is backed up. Um, the material contributing to these seed orchards is, is um, shared by all partners and also the funding related to the, um, the screening, the testing, seed collection, buy-in collection and grafting. All these costs and contributions are shared by partners. We're also looking for more candidate sites to expand our orchard network. We're entirely funded by grant proposals and donations. So consider becoming a member if you're calling us or if you're watching this webinar from Canada. 
We are also looking for help on our committees, social media, grants and fundraising, and just to spread the word to support and protect these important ecosystems. Um, to build capacity in Canada, we have been hosting field training sessions that are accredited for professional development by different professional organizations. And so this year we're hosting two, one in early June and one in early July. And I'm just putting the link in the chat if anyone wants to sign up for those. And also super exciting, um, we are hosting this year's annual science and management conference in beautiful Revelstoke, BC. The theme is Pines and People, Human Impacts on Five Needle Pine. It's a two day conference to learn all the latest and greatest and have lots of great social events with their friends and piney pals. Also right before, the, the day before the meeting, the afternoon is a field tour of the government of BC facility at the Kalamalka Research Station, which is doing our blister rest disease resistance testing of white bark pine. And after that, the day after, we have a field trip to see white bark pine and golden. So you can register online, submit a talk or a poster, especially if you're a student, we would love to see what you're working on. There's a link in the chat for that as well. And uh, yeah, I just wanna, I guess, thank all of our partners to date, working on so many different projects across Canada and across borders. So of course, the White Park Pine Ecosystem Foundation, Environment Canada Climate Change, um, Natural Resources Canada, Canadian Forest Service, the governments of BC and Alberta, Habitat Conservation Trust Fund, the Columbia Basin Fund, Society for Ecological Restoration in Northern BC, BC Conservation Foundation, American Forests, Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program, the USDA Forest Service, Nature Conservancy, Buckley Valley Research Center, FRI Research, BC Forest Genetics Council, Tech, Shell, Kootenai Avalanche Courses, Bohemian Spirits, Yellow Point Propagation, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Old Man Watershed Council, Watershed Biosphere Reserve Association, and Dezeco Alpine Adventures. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jody, for the update. It is my pleasure to now introduce today's speaker, Katie Nicolato. Katie is a master's student in forest geomatics and a member of the Aerial Information Systems Lab at the Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. She is also a geospatial analyst and remote pilot for the Davy Resource Group Drone Services team. Katie has studied and interpreted forest ecosystems for 15 years in positions with the U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Universities of Alaska, Montana, and Maryland, and Alliance for Community Trees. Her commitment to Whiteberg Pine began seven years ago as a civil cultural technician for the Malheur National Forest, where she monitored, climbed, and protected trees in the remote Strawberry Mountains of Eastern Oregon. Her continued work with Whiteberg pine in this region is featured in recent issues of Nutcracker Notes, the, the journal of the White Park Pine Ecosystem Foundation. Her latest article in the spring 2023 issue is titled Using Drones to Support Five Needle Pine Conservation. Katie's relationship with White Park Pine also extends into her personal life as a skier, backpacker, climber, and musician. So if you have any questions during Katie's talk, you are welcome to type them in the chat and I will read them aloud at the end. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Katie. Thanks, Theo. Also, thank you to all the organizers, um, especially the grad students, Vlad, Laurel, and Theo. I know how difficult it is to get anything done while in grad school. So it's awesome and impressive that you guys are able to organize this for everyone. So thank you so much. And I guess also thanks to all the other speakers uh, that have presented throughout this um, this series. It's quite an honor to be included. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. So my talk is going to be about using unmanned aerial systems uh, and on the ground hiking surveys to uh, look at white bark pine in Oregon strawberry mountains. And I kind of wish I had titled it a bit differently because I definitely want to take a broader approach to this rather than just talking about using drones in the strawberry mountains. Um, as we go through the webinar, I would love if um, this could be kind of a a discussion or opportunity for thoughts about using unmanned aerial systems or drones to work with white bark pine and all 
a high elevation five needle pines, I would rather this not be like a, a research and results talk, but more of just kind of an informative session and to get you thinking about a, a possible future for this technology um, in white bark pine and five needle pine uh, conservation. And so uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Mike Bohannon, who is a botany staff on the Malheur National Forest. I would like to acknowledge the Malheur National Forest Silviculture and Botany uh, Divisions for all of their help over the years. And I would also like to acknowledge John Van Gundy, um, who has really been kind of the driving force behind a lot of this work as I'll explain uh, in a bit. And I would also like to thank my partner, Mark Kirstens for assistance in the field. And you can see um, on the right there, that's kind of our, our little team that I'll be uh, representing today. And John's gonna hate me for this, but I did wanna point out that uh, John was profiled in the latest uh, issue of Nutcracker Notes and it's quite a lovely read. It kind of put me at peace. He's a fascinating guy with a big heart and um, loves to help both people and, and nature. And like I said, is, is definitely like the driving force kind of behind a lot of this work. And I also wanted to recognize him because for those who might be students in this chat, he does um, contribute some funds towards a scholarship through the Whiteberg Pine Ecosystem Foundation Student Grant Program. So I think the applications have closed this year. But if you want to apply in the future, go ahead. And also, again, just to say thank you, John, for, for the personal work that you do for, uh, for white bark pine, especially in Oregon. Okay, so I'm going to start with an overview of my talk. So we'll begin with the project background. Then we'll go into the context of unmanned aerial systems in forestry and uh, five needle pines. Then we'll get into kind of the more specific meat of this talk, which is our uh, testing and use of, of uh, unmanned aerial systems or drones in the Strawberry Mountains of Oregon in particular. And then I'll finish with some considerations and conclusions. Like I said, I want this to be more of kind of a thought process and discussion about what you think you could do with drones to help conserve five needle pines. So as we go forward, consider a few questions here. Um, I'm gonna be addressing some specific things, some general things about you know, drone protocols and you know, how this technology might help you. But as we go through this talk, uh, consider how drones can possibly help accomplish your program objectives, if they could be useful for whatever you may be doing to conserve five needle pine species or just white bird pine. Also, what do you need to know to conduct successful drone operations, especially in the rugged variable terrain that we find uh, five needle pine species? There are a lot of different things we need to think about than when we're flying a drone in town or in your backyard, right? Just like any type of field work. And the final thing is, what is the future of drones in high elevation five needle pine conservation if there is a future for them there? So we'll start with project background. And there are some people in this uh, webinar I know that really aren't quite familiar with white bark pine. And I know most of us are and are very passionate about it, but I do wanna give a quick rundown for people that might not really understand the importance of white bark pine and high elevation and five needle pines in general. So on the right here, this is an uh, old growth white bark pine. These trees can live to be hundreds of years old. They live at tree line in subalpine and alpine environments. A lot of times you will see them afflicted with krumholtz, so kind of gnarled and shaped by the wind and the elements. And they're important for a number of reasons. And one is that they are a keystone species in their environment and also a charismatic species in their environment for also multiple reasons. And one here that I wanna point out, perhaps since we are selfish creatures is humans love them. And so I've got this picture of skiers here and uh, you'll find white bark pine in areas where you will recreate a lot at high elevation. So doing skiing, backpacking, climbing, that kind of thing. And so it really adds to the aesthetic and it's very iconic. It's a super iconic tree in the West for those of us who don't live in the West. 
And alongside that, it provides really important ecosystem services for animals and for the abiotic uh, environment. So it holds snowpack and helps regulate the watershed and provides homes and food habitat for many different animals. And some of the most famous include the Clark's nutcracker and species of bear, along with some songbirds, nuthatches, woodpeckers, um, other mammals, squirrels. But the Clark's nutcracker is famously linked to the white bark pine through um, its dispersal of seeds. So the white bark pine really couldn't survive without the Clark's nutcracker. Uh, it needs the Clark's nutcracker to disperse its seed and the Clark's nutcracker needs the white bark pine for nesting substrate and food. And they're a very iconic bird, definitely one of my favorites. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room share that sentiment. And alongside that, the grizzly and black bears also uh, love to consume the white bark pine and you'll see them foraging for these pines uh, as well. So those are some iconic animals that are associated with this pine. But unfortunately, 51% uh, of standing white bark pines are now dead and they were listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in December of 2022 with a lot of help from the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation themselves. And they're listed as threatened because of some major threats. A lot of us here understand that the mountain pine beetle is uh, decimating large swaths of uh, white bark pine, killing them and creating ghost forests. Another one is white pine blister rust. So that's an invasive pathogen that um, also kills these trees and Another one is climate change and intensified fire activity because of that uh, climate change. And so there is a very, very concerted effort between the Forest Service, American Forest, the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, and others to conserve white bark pine and save them. And a lot of that work is through genetic testing and experimentation to find um, certain factions of these trees that are resistant to blister rust and to the climatic intense elements that, that they're facing. So that's just a little bit of background on the tree. For those of you that aren't familiar with this super important iconic species of the West. But more specifically for this talk, we're going to be focusing on white bark pine in the Malheur National Forest in John Day, Oregon, USA. And so here we have a map of the white bark pine range and it's a huge range, but I love this. We're focusing on such a small area of this range today, which is right here on the Malheur National Forest. And so you can see there are kind of like two sections there, a Northern section and a Southern section. And so that Southern red area is where we're focusing on today, which is the Strawberry Mountain Range. The upper Northern section is the uh, Vinegar Hill Indian Rock area of the Malheur National Forest, but that's a picture of the Strawberry Mountain Range. It's absolutely stunning. Living there was abs an absolute privilege. Um, and even though it's a very, very small part of the White Bark Pine Range, um, the instances of blister rust and mountain pine beetle are not as great like as other places. So the White Bark Pine there are doing pretty decent. I don't know if that's just because they're such a small habitat, but um, I don't know, I like to think that they're doing, they're doing pretty well there. So that's where we're gonna to be today. And so to kind of introduce the work and our team a little bit, um, we are all either current or former Malheur National Forest silviculture and botany staff. I no longer work with the Malheur National Forest. Uh, I work with them personally, but uh, as stated, I'm a graduate student at Oregon State University and um, I work for Davie Resource Group. Um, and we are supporting the forest and the Forest Service Region 6 White Bark Pine Protection Programs through, again, personal work and citizen science. And that's a picture of John and I on the bottom left and a picture um, of Matt Winton and John and Mel Allerton, who are also both former employees of the Malheur National Forest. And so in December 2022, as stated, white bark pine was listed as threatened under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And so our group had already been doing this work for years. I've been working with white bark pine for, as stated, seven years at this point. But when that happened, I think along with a lot of other people, we really felt even more drive to kind of help with this effort, especially because the listing 
is likely to bring in more money, more funds, and yeah, just more energy and effort towards white bark pine and all five needle pine conservation. So we're very, you know, focused on in our heads, how can we build on this momentum from that listing, even though it is very unfortunate, we don't want this tree to be listed, it is also a catalyst for, you know, again, more money and effort and publications to flow towards this tree. So that's kind of what we're focused on. And so some of our recent publications, so you can kind of get an idea of what we've been working on. I'm going to highlight three. And so uh, kind of our furthest back one was in fall 2021 in Nutcracker Notes, volume 41, which again is the Journal of the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, where we explored the Strawberry Mountains doing hiking surveys. So just physically looking for new instances of white bark pine on foot in certain areas. And so the Malheur National Forest maintained a database that's about 20 years old of 164 trees. I might be wrong. I know there's some people uh, here who would correct me maybe, but uh, we wanted to supplement that database with work of our own. And that database was mainly priority trees that were cone bearing or focused on for, again, that genetic resistance testing to white pine blister rust. And during that time, we found almost 500 new instances of trees, but we were recording, you know, uh, regenerating trees, multi-stem trees, mature trees. Uh, we, they ran the whole gamut. I'll talk a bit more about this later. And then we also described new subpopulations of white bark pine at six different sites. And so here's a map from that publication that might help you understand a little bit better the kind of work we were doing. And so you can see the, the boundary of the forest, you can see the nine areas that are, I think there are more areas, but those are kind of the nine areas that, that our team is familiar with and focused on. In the forest, I mentioned Indian Rock, Vinegar Hill, but uh, for that publication, we were focused on the Lookout Mountain area and Strawberry Mountain area, kind of down in that white little square, which is where we recorded those 480 individual uh, white bark pine. And so we took information on the diameter, the height, their condition, and any pertinent information, also the GPS location. So we basically created a whole kind of new additional database for the forest. So again, you can refer to that publication from fall 2021. Next, in winter 2023, we put out an article about uh, identifying post-fire white bark pine refugia that might be harboring regenerating white, white bark pine. So we visited five different burn areas that burned across um, a range of uh, 26 years. And we were looking to describe potential drivers of post-fire regeneration uh, based on our observations. And I'll, again, explain a little bit more about that later, but I'll jump right into the map on this one. So we were looking at the Bald Sisters Fire, Canyon Creek Complex, Glacier Fire, High Roberts Fire, and Snowshoe Fire. And we identified kind of four different um, populations represented by those white stars that we felt really like embodied um, things that forest managers should focus on in their protection efforts. So basically taking what, what was working for the, the regenerating white bark pine to begin with and building on that. So kind of using what nature already had. And then finally, uh, this just came out, I think last week or a few weeks ago, we had an article that focused on using drones to support five needle pine conservation. And so I would like everyone as they're again listening to this webinar to kind of think of this article and if possible you know if you read this article it was kind of meant to go hand in hand with this webinar um, so that this kind of written description of uh, recommendations we had for drone usage to support work, work pine conservation they're listed there um, there are seven of them and I'm not going to get into them as much now I'm going to revisit them in that considerations and conclusions section, because I do want you to be able to kind of absorb that and think about like why these might be good recommendations. But the recommendations are using drones or unmanned aerial systems for stand exploration, kind of like what we were doing on foot, but using a drone to do that. Forest inventory and health monitoring, as you have heard, these pines are uh, extremely threatened. So using drones to potentially help with that. Aerial cone monitoring, maintaining a visual media database of white bark pine individuals and stands, 
um, doing proof of concept research, using drones for science communication and to unify stakeholders with technology. So again, I'll get into that a little bit later, but just keep that in mind as we go further forward. And so future plans that our team has is to do some dendrochronology or aging and tree coring of whitebark pine in certain areas of the Malheur National Forest. We're going to perform more exploratory hiking surveys, including in the Indian Rock and Crockett Knob Burn and Skyline Trail, hopefully, maybe starting this summer. Region six, the US Forest Service Region six has a series of whitebark, whitebark pine monitoring plots in the Strawberry Mountain Wilderness that have been maintained for years. We've been working uh, with these plots for years. And so um, some region six folks are going to go back and measure those plots. So we may be assisting them with that. We are also gonna maintain and continue to develop our whitebark pine geospatial database in conjunction with the Malheur National Forest and potentially there might be some planting uh, in the future going on, which is really, really, really exciting because that's not that doesn't happen all the time. So that's really exciting. So those are some of our future plans, and a little bit of just a background on what's going on with with myself and the team that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's go into unmanned aerial systems and forestry and five needle pines to give you some context for why we're doing this work. So recently, in the last couple of years, there have been a number of unprecedented Weiberg Pine restoration plans put into action uh, by members of the Weiberg Pine Ecosystem Foundation, American Forest, the US Forest Service. And so the core of these restoration plans is to prioritize core areas that could benefit the most um, or like most easily be worked to be restored basically. And so knowing that, prioritizing those core areas, how, how would you know whether that restoration is working um, or um, how to perform that restoration? And so both of these plans, so these are, these are two of the biggest ones. So the National Wiper Pine Restoration Plan is probably probably one of the biggest ones. Um, it brought together so many different people from all over the country, agencies, tribes, legislators. Like it's absolutely incredible. It's a Herculean effort. It's amazing. And there was another one at the bottom there that focuses on the crown of the continent ecosystem, which is kind of in Central North America, shared by Canada and and the U.S. And that brought together a lot of, of authors too. So those are two of the biggest ones. And so both of them mentioned that um, monitoring efforts really need to happen to, again, quantify or clarify whether restoration is working and what type of restoration should be happening. And so I kind of pulled out some quotes from these plans. And uh, the first here is that um, managers must impl implement surveys to assess health status and trends of whitebark pine and in the greater context, all high elevation five needle pines. So basically when I say white, whitebark pine, I do also, I'm kind of implying that I'm talking about more high elevation five, five needle pines. Um, we need to monitor stand health and conditions over time, integrate monitoring into project planning and management, and use monitoring outcomes to adjust treatments for successful restoration and conservation, so adaptive management. So we can't just do something or implement a plan. We need to watch what happens and change our methods if it's not working or keep doing what we're doing if it's if it's doing well. And then Oops. And then also from this other uh, document, monitoring treatment effectiveness is critical for adaptive management. So kind of backing up that statement. And then also another one that I wanted to pull out is that connectivity and distribution of populations are key considerations when developing restoration plans. Because if you don't have, you know, continuous populations of white bark pine and five needle pines, you're not going to get proper regeneration. It's going to be patchy. Um, you know, seed dispersal is going to be very difficult. So understanding how to measure that or monitor that or focus on that is key. And so here's a diagram from the National Whitebark Pine Restoration Plan that, that goes into that more. And I wanted to highlight here, monitoring adaptive management, long-term landscape scale, high resolution monitoring leads to effective adaptive management. Those are my words. So how do we monitor in this way, long-term, landscape scale, while also addressing individual trees and 
high resolution. And so to me, the perfect way to do that is with aerial forest remote sensing. Notice I didn't say drones immediately. I wanna talk about just kind of traditional established methods first. And so for those who don't understand what this means, aerial is just from the sky, obviously, and remote sensing means measuring without touching. So a lot of times this is done with a sensor or taking pictures. And so some of the established methods that are regularly used for remote sensing of the environment and of forests or satellites, such as the ones I listed here, these are just a bunch of very famous, well-used satellites uh, with some, some nice acronyms for you there. Another way is with manned aircraft, so airplanes, helicopters, with cameras attached, or with people inside who are looking at the landscape and measuring that. Um, some examples are the National Agriculture Imagery Program and the G-Light sensor, which is a combination of light detection and ranging, hyperspectral sensor and thermal sensor that can be attached to a manned aircraft. The use of two-dimensional imagery, whether it's just your normal color, red, green, blue imagery, hyperspectral imagery or thermal imagery is a very, um, well, maybe not hyper, hyper, hyperspectral, but a cheaper way. Two-dimensional imagery is, is cheap, right? Take a picture from an airplane um, to use remote sensing to measure forests beneath you. And then the next kind of level up is three-dimensional remote sensing. So using technology such as light detection and ranging, which is an active remote sensing method where a photon or a laser pulse or multiple laser pulses is sent down towards um, the earth and then returned back to the sensor, which creates an XYZ coordinate in space. And you can create a three-dimensional model of the forest or whatever you want really using this technology. And then photogrammetry, which is measuring from pictures. And you can now use what's called structure from motion or 3D photogrammetry to piece you know, hundreds of pictures together to create a three-dimensional model. So those are some established methods that have been used for decades. Well, some of them, LIDAR and photogrammetry or um, structure from motion are a little bit newer. And so I also wanna to touch upon resolution and scale. And I know that Laurel Sindewald did uh, a lot of this talking about this in her awesome talk like a month ago, but I'm just gonna go over it again for those of you who are new. So resolution and scale are some of the most important concepts in aerial remote sensing. So there's spatial resolution, which is the size and structure of objects on the ground that you're measuring. And a lot of times pixel size of an image will, um, be used to uh, do that or to understand that. And then spectral resolution is another option. So instead of using size and structure of objects or features on the ground, you're using color and reflectance and values on the electromagnetic spectrum. So the visible light spectrum or the infrared spectrum to kind of Look at vegetative health, for example, the way that light is reflected back. And then temporal resolution. So that's the frequency of observations and the repeatability of whatever data collection you're doing. So how often can you revisit something uh, over time? So for example, satellites will make you know, a rotation around the earth and they'll, they'll measure a certain amount of times or you'll take a flight in an airplane you know, once a year or twice a year. So that's like temporal resolution. And then there's scale. So there's landscape scale, which means data coverage across a large and complex area, like an entire forest. But then there's also individual tree scale in the concept of forestry, which is data coverage of a discrete and contained record. So an individual tree. So, you know, sometimes you'll do remote sensing and by the end of it, you'll have a tree list of many trees, but an individual record for each tree. So those are just some basics of remote sensing that are critical to think about as we move forward. And so um, this is a lot to look at, but I did wanna pull out some literature that kind of exemplifies, including some of Laurel's uh, research that I mentioned earlier, which is pretty awesome. Um, just kind of showing traditional methods of remote sensing. So these papers use aerial surveys by humans and airplanes, um, satellite imagery from the Worldview satellite or the Landsat satellite, or um, you know, even using machine learning such as eDART to use Landsat like imagery to uh, quantify things. So those are just some, some of those examples there, but we're in a new era at this point. And that is the era of drones 
or unmanned aerial systems, and they can be used for whitebark pine conservation. And so for those who don't have any experience with drones, um, drones are also called remote aircraft or unmanned aerial vehicles kind of interchangeably. And they carry payloads that can detect information. So like a sensor, like a camera or a LIDAR, light detection and ranging sensor, like I mentioned earlier, or disperse material such as seeds or maybe herbicide or pesticide even. And drones can cover tens, hundreds, and thousands of forested acres in one flight mission with centimeter resolution. And so the advantage that drones provide over some of the traditional methods I just mentioned is honestly the resolution. That centimeter resolution is amazing. Satellites can give you 30 meters, 10 meters. Airplanes can give you one meter. And when I say one meter, that means that the pixel in an image is equal to one meter of space on the ground, for example. So imagine having an image where each pixel is equal to a centimeter on the ground. That's pretty amazing. Here I've listed three of the most common types of aircrafts. So a multi-rotor copter, a fixed wing aircraft, and a VTOL or vertical uh, takeoff and landing drone. The one downside to drones is that a lot of times you so some drones, like a fixed wing drone, can cover a really, really large area. So thousands of acres or hundreds of acres, but some of the quadcopters or just the copters can only cover tens of acres. So unlike a satellite or an airplane, which can like really, really uh, cover a landscape, that's the kind of one downside to drones is that you got to change batteries a lot, or some drones just don't cover that, that big of a landscape area, though they still do cover a landscape area or entire forest stance. So just something to keep in mind. I always like to give the pros and cons to drones. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And so there are uh, some advantages that UAS offers in white bark pine and five needle pine uh, monitoring in general. They are inexpensive and safe compared to having a large field crew out there or using a manned aircraft. They reduce the risk associated with those things. So less strenuous hiking, less of a chance of injury and exhaustion. They are high resolution uh, data collection tools. As I said, spatial, spectral, and temporal um, resolution is very high. So centimeter resolution of spatial resolution, spectral resolution is high because you can attach many different types of sensors, including hyperspectral sensors, which allow you to see many, many, many bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then temporally, you can go out and collect drone data every day if you want. Like that's not, you can't do that with an airplane necessarily or a satellite. They cover all data scales from the landscape to the stand level to the individual tree level. And they're non-invasive for sensitive ecosystems. This is, I think, one of my favorite things about drones is that they're non-invasive. So you're not, you know, darting an animal to like measure what it's eating, or you're not, you know, necessarily interfering with someone or something's habitat or life. The only kind of annoyance is that there's a brief, a brief amount of noise, which honestly isn't even that bad if you move a little bit far away from it. So those are some of the advantages, advantages to think about in white bark pine uh, monitoring and five needle pine monitoring. And so resolution and scale related to five needle pines, again, the individual trees stand in landscape scale metrics can be achieved at centimeter resolution. And some of those metrics that might be important to people in this webinar or just people in the greater community of white bark pine scientists in general or managers in general, is that you can use these metrics for forest mensuration, which means measuring different variables about trees. So height, diameter, species, um, live crown, things like that, and inventory and health. So you can measure mortality of trees and of white bark pine. And you can also focus on the threats that are specific to white bark pine. So you can measure mortality or effects of white pine blister rust, mountain pine beetles, uh, intense wildfire, and the climate stressors that I mentioned earlier. And then maybe most importantly, which is kind of looping back to those restoration plans I was talking about, the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan, the Crown of the Continent Restoration Plan, is that you can use drones to measure restoration progress and post-implementation results. So there's that kind of long-term high-resolution monitoring I was talking about. And there are a few limits to temporal scale, mainly being the availability of pilots and field personnel to do drone missions and seasonal weather conditions that might get in your way. Um, so in the spring, fall, and winter, it's kind of hard to fly a drone in a subalpine ecosystem. And so here, because I highlighted some literature about more established remote sensing methods, I threw in some 
about uh, drone methods. Um, and there are fewer examples, but they are growing. And one that I want to really focus on briefly is this one, the augmenting size models for Pine Astrobiformis seedlings using dimensional estimates from unmanned aircraft systems for a couple of reasons. So Pine Astrobiformis is Southwestern white pine. And I wanna highlight this because uh, Corey Garms is a former uh, PhD student, now a doctor uh, in my lab. And Michael Wing and Bogdan Strimbu are two of my graduate advisors. So they're all authors on this paper. And I love this paper because it shows the use of unmanned aerial systems to monitor uh, southwestern white pine in a controlled environment. So at the Arboretum in Flagstaff, Arizona, there are uh, common garden boxes where they are growing southwestern white pine seedlings to look at, again, their resistance to white pine blister rust through genetic trials, for example. And so these uh, pictures here are showing you canopy height models and kind of bulk density models of the seedlings in those common garden boxes. So what you're seeing on the top is kind of the year one of these seedlings being measured with a drone and turned into a three-dimensional model. And then on the bottom, you're seeing in 2018, the next year, they were measured twice, the growth in those seedlings. And so the drone was flown, I think like 15 to 20 meters above these boxes. And Corey measured um, also like thermal uh, metrics for these boxes to see where the sunlight was hitting it at different times of day. Um, and then additionally, here's another picture from that where you can see a vegetation mask was used to look at individual seedlings. So I think they were planted in like 10 by 10. So like it's like a hundred seedlings per box or something. Um, and you can extract those seedlings using a vegetation mask, uh, using a geographic information system process. And so, like I said, I just love this study because I think it's a super unique use of using drones to study uh, five needle pines because it's not in this uncontrolled forest environment. You can also use it in a nursery scenario where, uh, managers are testing for resistance to blister rust. And I just, I just love that. I just wanted to point that one out. And then the last thing I wanted to address in this section is actually part of my uh, master's research. So everything I just told you about has nothing, <laughs> has nothing to do with what I'm actually doing for graduate school, but this does where I'm using aerial LIDAR in a post-fire subalpine forest. And so this site is below the summit of Strawberry Mountain. And I wanted to use this as, as an example to show you what you can achieve with aerial light detection and ranging. So I'm using LIDAR to um, demonstrate the effects of salvage logging on black-backed Lewis's and white-headed woodpecker habitat after the Canyon Creek fire in 2015. And so I'm, I'm literally looking at before, LIDAR that was taken before and after salvage logging so I can see the differences between forest structure and where woodpeckers place place their nests and and how it changes their habitat and so with aerial LIDAR I've been able to classify mortality of trees I've been able to create canopy height models and individual tree segmentation and also show LIDAR intensity which is the strength of those um, photons or laser pulses that are sent down to the landscape and returned to the aerial sensor. And that can be an indication of many metrics. Um, most importantly, people use this metric to look at mortality. So um, just, again, an example of really what you can achieve uh, by using an aerial sensor like that. Okay, so now we'll move on to the main, the main event, which is talking about using unmanned aerial systems to uh, look at white bark pine in the Strawberry Mountains. And as I said, this is gonna be less of a um, results and research talk and more of just like a, here's what we tried. Here's some methods that you can use and maybe do them better than we did. So again, here's that map. And so in this um, part, we are looking at, again, in that lower corner under the, the subpopulations map, where it says like Rail Creek, Lookout Mountain, Little Baldy Mountain, that's the area that we're focusing on right now for this part. 
And so in 2019 through 2022, I explained earlier, we conducted hiking surveys to establish that new database of 480 undocumented white bark pine stems and clusters of diverse ages, heights, diameters, and conditions to add to the already existing uh, database that the Malheur National Forest had. And we also visited five burn areas where wildfires occurred over a 26 year period. And in those burn areas, um, some of the drivers of post fire white bark pine regeneration that we found in refugia sites were trees being uh, multi stemmed, which uh, it's been shown in the literature to increase chances of survival. So if one stem dies, maybe the other stems will stay alive. Um, and uh, a lot of multi-stem trees are formed from those birds, the Clark's nutcracker caching white bark pine seeds. So it kind of shows a healthy relationship there at that site. Um, another driver is that white bark pine are in a riparian ecosystem. So a groundwater dependent ecosystem, it's wet. There's a lot of riparian vegetation um, that creates kind of a refugia from climate effects. And also having um, co-dominant or dominant Western white pine in the area because a lot of Western white pine um, indicators can be similar to those of, of uh, white bark pine, especially like the, their resistance to blister rust. Um, they have like, they show kind of similar, similar effects. And then also Ceanothus, which is a big, pretty annoying shrub if you're doing field work, but it can also act as a, as a nursery plant for conifer seedlings while they're trying to grow. And so that's kind of what we identified through these hiking surveys in those years. So here's some pictures of us doing that work. And so you see Mike Bohannon on the left, looking at a huge hillside of Ceanothus, which uh, we'll get into a little bit later more about that. And then John is doing a lot of um, scoping, measuring and writing down, looking at the map. So that's just kind of our on foot kind of aspect of that. And I love this, this part of, uh, of, of the white bark pine field work. I could spend all day out there. And then in 21, 2021 and 2022, we decided to integrate unmanned aerial systems and our main question was, how can drones aid in finding, inventorying, and interpreting, interpreting remote white bark pine stands? And so by interpreting, I mean both amongst ourselves. So like, what can we see with a drone or, fi or figure out with a drone? And then kind of think about why certain things might be happening in a stand or to a tree. But then also interpreting that knowledge to other people, like I am doing right now in this webinar, which you'll see more later. So that's kind of our main goal here. And so uh, think about that, that uh, Nutcracker Notes article that I mentioned earlier, and I'll come back to later. Some of these um, advantages are mentioned in that article and were part of that list that I was talking about earlier. But the first really most giant improvement here was site accessibility and coverage. So featured here is that huge hillside of Ceanothus. Uh, this is at Rail Creek and you can truly see how dense it is if you look at John and I in the top pictures and then just the coverage of, of it over the landscape in the bottom. So in that Ceanothus is white bark pine and Western white pine. And so getting to those seedlings, which might be covered sometimes by that Ceanothus was extremely difficult. And so using a drone to scope out those areas made it a lot easier to, uh, to find the seedlings and keep track of them. And then another one is, uh, you know, rocks, cliffs, the terrain can be really rough. Uh, that's me on the left um, doing some backcountry skiing up to, that's actually a, a limber pine um, in uh, Southern California. And so just having to encounter these landscapes, you can see in that middle photo, those two big trees in the middle are two of the Malheur National Forest pr priority white bark pines. And you'll see a huge cliff above them, below it's a big, uh, you know, scree slope. And so being able to use drones to view individual trees and stands makes it a whole lot easier to get field work done and to gather good information. And it, it keeps people from, from getting hurt and tired. And so here's another application that I just love. I think this has huge potential. Um, I would love to see this kind of used more in the future, but it's, it's for cone monitoring. And so this can be helpful because, for example, white bark pine go through cycles every two years of um, growing cones. And so climbers will go up and cage those cones to protect them throughout the summer from Clark's nutcrackers and squirrels, for example, so that they can then be collected and used for 
genetic research and propagation of trees that are immune to white, bark, uh, white pine blister us. And so you can use drones to not only kind of quantify the, co the cone crop, but to kind of plan your scheduling, your climbing schedules and your, your monitoring and management schedules around these cone crops. And so uh, I just like manually went through this picture and uh, some of the pictures that I've taken and found the cones there and I, and I highlighted them. So that's a lot of cones. That's a nice looking tree. That's a high priority tree for the Mount here National Forest. So they focus on that every year and make sure that they keep a good record of that tree. I also have been on the side doing a little bit of experimentation with um, image classification. So training the computer to identify cones. I don't have those results for you today, but that's just something I wanted to put in your mind is I think that there's huge potential for automating the process of counting cones. Like if you have a data set of hundred trees, you don't wanna go through it and like count all the cones yourself. Maybe you wanna tell the computer to do it for you. So I just love that. Um, I, I feel like this could be really big. And here's another picture. This is actually a sugar pine, again, in, in Southern California. I'm on a job uh, for Davy Resource Group right now in Southern California. So I decided to take some extra footage and throw, throw some stuff in there uh, for you. So this is a sugar pine. And then again, um, oops, here are those cones on the sugar pine. So those aren't mature cones, but yeah. So sugar pines and limber pines are also five needle pines uh, that the uh, White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation and others focus on. So again, a really cool use of drones to uh, keep track of cone crop. And then reproduction monitoring. We use a drone to fly sites where uh, there was white bark pine reproducing. And so you can see outlined by the yellow flagging, the little baby uh, white bark pines there, which um, I would say this was kind of hard. Like, I don't, I, I don't know if I'd recommend this, but uh, it is something to think about, especially if you want to do an automated mapping flight where you might be able to pick up different spectral and structural signatures of these little baby uh, regenerating white bark pines after wildfire, for example, which leads me into two-dimensional and three-dimensional mapping. Uh, these are examples of three-dimensional LIDAR mapping flights that uh, I performed in areas that can be prone to sugar pine, for example. And so you can set up drones to fly automatically and create a three-dimensional model of a stand. Um, and then you can use that information to quantify certain variables in that stand, again, such as mortality and age and things like that. And then another one is visual media oops, content creation, which is really important for a couple of reasons. Um, again, pictured here, you've got limber pine, white bark pine, and sugar pine. And so that can be helpful simply to have a database of individual priority trees that you can keep track of their health. For example, if you're a forest manager or a, a silviculturist, um, just to like have a visual record of these trees every year or however often you want your temp temporal resolution to be. And then additionally, this can be super helpful to have photo and video for um, social media, for science communication, for um, just communicating with people and kind of making them care about, about these species and making five middle pines popular, for example. Okay, so to our last section, considerations and conclusions. I know I'm running out of time here, so I'll try to make it quick, but it, this one's a little bit wordy. And so this section is for anyone who actually wants to consider using drones to monitor and manage uh, white bark pine and five needle pines. So again, we're gonna revisit our three questions. How can drones help accomplish your program objectives? What do you need to know to conduct successful drone operations? And what is the future of drones in high elevation five needle pine conservation? So hopefully your gears have been turning and you've been kind of thinking about that. And I'm bringing it back again to those seven recommended applications for high elevation five needle pines. Stand exploration, forest inventory and health monitoring, cone monitoring, creating a visual media database, conducting proof of concept research, because as I've shown, this technology is kind of new in the realm of five needle pines. So there's a lot of opportunity to do innovative novel research here. You can use drones for science communication, both to create products for science communication and to bring people together and encourage people to love white bark pine, five needle pines, and drones, and to unify stakeholders in a shared mission of using this technology for good. And so the first step is to develop a transferable framework 
that can be transferred between white bark pine monitoring plans for five needle pines. Where and when does it make sense to use drones? Which variables will you measure? What are the protocols you're gonna enact? What's the best equipment for the job? Strengths, weaknesses, current and potential challenges, personnel training, hardware and software that you need, if you have any budget restrictions, and if you want to fuse drones with other technologies, so human surveyors, terrestrial and mobile data, satellites and manned aircraft, for example. And then a few challenges that you might encounter. Fieldwork's gonna be the hardest one. You're working in an area that is extremely variable, mountainous, mountainous regions. These trees live at high elevations. Um, so I would suggest planning your flights for June, July and August. Otherwise you're gonna be socked in like the picture in the background there. This was a super windy day when we were trying to do some on foot surveys. You want to time your field work with natural cycles. So if you want to measure cone production, Clark's breeding and nesting and maybe how the pines are looking at that moment while they're doing that um, and relating that to resources that are available to those birds or during fire season, making sure you're not flying when there's smoke out or fire ops happening. And then really important, the air at high elevations is thinner, which will affect aircraft behavior. So it'll, it will affect battery life, the ability for it to hold payloads. Strenuous ground truthing cannot be avoided even with drones because you're in a mountainous region and you need to make sure that what you're measuring with the drone is the same as what's on the ground. It's logistically remote, so you need to consider your battery, vehicle, and crew management and what type of drone to use. If it's heavy, you might need to carry it in a backpack, so you've got to think about that. It's illegal to fly beyond visual line of sight without a waiver from the Federal Aviation Administration. It's illegal to fly in designated wilderness, and designated wilderness includes 29% of Whitebark Pines U.S. range. And it's also illegal to fly near wildfire operations, so all things to think about. And then challenges for drone, for the drones themselves. I recommend seeking advice when you're beginning your drone journey if you want to start, because you'll save a lot of headaches when it comes to compatibility between systems, acquiring the proper equipment for the task, and realistically understanding timelines, budgets, and deliverables for projects. Um, I don't know where I'd be without the mentorship of my graduate advisors and lab meets. Um, straight up, it would have been a lot harder for me. Uh, do you want to have a drone program in-house, or would you like to outsource it? This depends on the skills, budget, time, and interest available to your program. You need to add time and resources for ground truthing operations and mistakes, especially in high elevation terrain with complex forest data sets. And you must be licensed to commercially operate a drone through FAA Part 107 licensing or to dispense agriculturally seed or spray, which is a Part 137 license. And finally, um, a lot of times people don't want you flying a foreign made, so mainly a Chinese drone uh, over property or um, sensitive areas. And so you need to think about using a blue UAS, a, a, a drone that is on the um, list that's approved by the Defar Department of Defense to fly in certain areas. And then a last challenge is with analysis. So you may need advanced or expensive sensors and software to detect forest variables better, such as a LIDAR, hyperspectral, or terrestrial scanner, but you can achieve a lot of goals with video, two-dimensional images, images, and photogrammetry. Also, working with complex forest data sets like three-dimensional LIDAR and photogrammetry requires specialized knowledge and skills. I went to graduate school to learn how to do this, but not everyone can do that, and so the internet is an awesome place to figure those things out. And then processing, processing large data sets is computationally tough and may require the use of cloud services, a powerful desktop computer, or increased storage and memory, which is going to cost you money. And so to kind of wrap it up, I just want to let you know about the present and future of drones and forestry. So this is what we're looking at right now and into the future. This is where you want to be if you want to be on the cutting edge and front line of this is autonomous deployment and remote docks. So drones that are just stationed out somewhere or you can just launch them from the back of your truck and they just do their own thing and you don't have to do anything. Beyond visual line of sight waivers. So you can apply for waivers through the FAA that allow you to fly drones without being able to see them. Simultaneous localization and mapping or SLAM technology, which means that the drone kind of figures out where it is uh, while it's working versus you kind of having to give it predetermined GPS coordinates in simplest terms. It's kind of like how um, a self-driving car works. Artificial intelligence, deep learning and object recognition. So object avoidance or being able to say, hey, that's a tree stem or hey, that's a white bark pine. And then fusing terrestrial, mobile and aerial data together. Uh, into one data set, very dense. 
And so I would like to encourage uh, anyone interested in this to collaborate Thank with, you. yeah? To collaborate with um, parties such as the Forest Service Research Stations, universities with drone programs, the private industry consultants and developers, and public and citizen scientists who are passionate about this. And this is my last slide, but uh, I also want to put in a word for using drones for science communication. Uh, when you're encountering drone hostility, which is quite common, I've had been threatened with shotguns before, for example, try to empathize and de-escalate a situation, uh, try to relate trees and drones to your audience, and try to unify stakeholders by demonstrating the use of this technology for good. For example, uh, using it for fire or wildfire mitigation, making sure that no wildfires are going to start is a great way uh, to do this. So uh, with that, sorry, I went a little bit over, but uh, that is it. And thank you so much for attending and thanks everyone for organizing this. Katie, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I, you have a gift for presenting technical information in really clear ways. So great last webinar of the 2022-23 series. I have posted a link to a survey where you can let us know how the tech work and the registration process worked for you and all of that. And you can make suggestions for topics or speakers for next year. Please feel free to suggest yourself if you would like to give a talk in the series. So since this is the last webinar, I just wanna take a minute to thank all of you for your participation and supporting the series. The idea is that we have a way to network, share, learn new things. And we're so grateful to all of you for showing up and making the series a success. Of course, I have to thank our speakers. Uh, each month we had a different one. All of the talks were amazing. Thank you for sharing your time and uh, your work with us. And then finally, a special thank you to our three organizers of the series this year, Teo, Vlad, and Laurel. They did all the heavy lifting from putting together the calendar for the year, for managing the Zoom and the reminders and the registrations and all of that. So then just very briefly, one more thank you before we close out. And that is to our new MCs for the next year. Remember, we take a break for summer. So we'll be back in September. We've got a new crew, again, three people. Um, two of them will be familiar to those of you who are regular participants. We have Laurel Sindwald coming back. Laurel, again, is working uh, in Diana Tombeck's lab. She's wrapping up her dissertation. Uh, she presented on her doctoral work, which is on limber pine at Treeline in Rocky Mountain National Park. We have my student, Enzo Martelli, uh, who um, also presented this year. He's in the PhD program in forestry and conservation science at University of Montana. He's working on sampling designs for monitoring white bark pine. And then I wanna welcome a third organizer new to the series and that's Lou Deloisi, who's working with Danielle Ulrich at Montana State University, doing a PhD in ecology and environmental sciences. She is focusing on physiological mechanisms and drivers of tree survival and mortality. And she's doing a dendro approach using uh, stable isotopes. And particularly of note, hopefully we'll get to hear from her next year, She's investigating physiological differences between white bark and limber. So that's a wrap on the series for next year. Please take a minute um, to fill out the survey. Um, if you need other information, you can reach me. I'll put my email in the chat. But also, we ran out of time for, time for questions to Katie. So Katie, if you would like, put your email in the chat and maybe people can follow up with you directly. Sounds good. I'll repost it and it's on that slide too. Oh, we're looking right at it, of course. Yeah. So thanks everyone. Have a great summer. Be safe out in the woods and uh, we hope we'll see you in September and potentially on the webinar, but potentially also at the conference. Thank you.